on a gun range at Fort Benning, Georgia. Members of the U.S. Army's elite marksmanship team fire one of the most powerful weapons in their arsenal. These are handmade Magnum rifles, specially fitted to the body of each shooter. The oversized guns and the souped-up shells they fire are unique in the world of firearms. They are Magnums. The targets in their gun sights are small because they are 600 yards away, a third of a mile. You will have 20 minutes to shoot 20 well-aimed shots. You may commence firing. The recoil is probably three times as much as an M16, and if you lay down there for about 40 minutes in a team match in 100 degree weather, you, you start to notice the weight of it and the recoil gets to you, so it's a little more mentally taxing, I think, to, to stay on top of it. Besides their obvious power, one of the things that makes these weapons so remarkable is the bullets travel at nearly three times the speed of sound, much faster than regular rounds. When spotters view the targets downrange, they can actually see the bullets cut through the air, something not possible with other guns. The Army places a high priority on its marksmanship team, so much so that each gun is handmade and every shell is hand-loaded by Army personnel to ensure the highest quality. The term magnum in the world of firearms means more power to push a bullet at a higher rate of speed. Many people believe only large caliber handguns are magnums. The caliber is determined by the size of the bullet. A 44 caliber gun, for example, has a bore that is 44 hundredths of an inch in diameter. In reality, any gun, pistol or rifle, that fires a bullet with extra gunpowder in its cartridge is considered a magnum. It's a generic term that can be applied to any weapon, handgun or rifle, loaded with more powerful rounds. The term magnum has come to mean something very, very powerful and very, very strong. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's because of cartridges and firearms that it has this connotation. In modern times, the gun's popularity can be traced directly to a famous movie line from the 1970s. The actor was Clint Eastwood. The movie was Dirty Harry. Movie director and firearms aficionado John Milius wrote the line. This is a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world, and it will blow your head clean off. Now, I don't know whether we fired five or six. But the question you've got to ask yourself is, are you lucky, punk? <laughs> but the desire for more power in a gun goes farther back in history than fighting crime on the streets of San Francisco. Packing more powerful loads was first developed in the 19th century in Britain when big game hunters removed the bullets from gun shells, added more grains of gunpowder, and then resealed the bullet to the cartridge. The result? Sometimes they got more power in the gun. Sometimes the gun blew up in their face. The reason why they wanted more power in a gun was simple. More force behind the bullet. Any sized bullet meant more striking power on a target. This, in turn, gave them a better chance of bringing down a charging animal before the animal had a chance to reach them. These overloaded shells and the guns that fired them were early versions of today's magnums. The guns were often called horse pistols because they were so bulky they could only be carried in the saddle of a horse. Well, probably one of the most extreme examples of the big, large caliber horse pistol was the British Model 1842 Lancer pistol. It was a, a real hunker. It was about 78 caliber. Uh, it fired a, a carbine load of, uh, of uh, 
powder, which is about a 60, 65 grain charge. And it was a real, real wrist breaker. But uh, it was probably guaranteed to stop anybody uh, if you hit them in the right area. The, the, the gun itself was so large, so unwieldy, and so uncomfortable to shoot that the soldiers themselves really didn't like it. They were issued to the Lancers and the Light Brigade, but as many of them threw them away and availed themselves of Colt or Adams revolvers. In the United States, the man known for pushing the limits of power in a gun was Samuel Walker. He was a member of the U.S. Army's Regiment of Mounted Rifles and was on his way to help start a new group of lawmen, the Texas Rangers. Teaming with fledgling gunmaker Samuel Colt, they created a six-shot revolver with a nine-inch barrel that could fire the most powerful round in the world. They called the gun, which fired a 44 caliber slug, the Walker Colt. Only 1,000 Walker Colts were made. But when the gun was introduced in 1846, it sent shockwaves across the American frontier. They devised this humongous, almost five pound, 44 caliber revolver. Uh, it was made by uh, the Eli Whitney at Whitneyville. And it fired, gosh, the, the powder charge was just about as big as that would be used in a military rifle. It was about a 60 grain powder charge behind a big 44 caliber ball. Uh, six shot, very, very effective, very, very popular gun. The new 44 caliber Walker Colt was the most powerful production revolver ever made until the 1980s. The old Colt Walker still packed more muzzle velocity, more muzzle energy than that 44 Magnum that Clint Eastwood, his Dirty Harry, held in the hands of that Model 29 Smith & Wes. In order for the gun to function, Walker and Colt designed a larger and stronger frame that could withstand the explosive charge of the heavily packed bullets. The result was a loud, violent revolver that fired six shots instead of the standard five. It was lethal at 100 yards, a much greater distance than most handguns of the time. You might say it was like bringing a howitzer to a knife fight. Uh, it was devastating to the enemy the first time they encountered it. Used had a real good chance that if somebody was hit with this, he was going down. The gun was a favorite of the Texas Rangers. The Rangers used the weapons in their fight with warring Comanche Indians, pushing the border with the natives back 300 miles in two years. Until then, the fight between the Rangers and the natives was practically a standoff. Walker and Ranger Jack Hayes owed their lives to the firepower of the gun. Jack Coffey Hayes and Sam Walker holed up in that, that uh, little canyon outside of uh, Utopia, Texas, fighting off dozens of Comanches with just a pair of revolvers. Normally, in any other fight, those two guys would have been instant history. But the power of the Walker Colt could not save its inventor from an early demise. Samuel Walker was fighting in the Mexican-American War in 1847. Walker led a group of 50 Texas Rangers against a stronghold of Mexican soldiers in the border town of Formantea. You see 500 of Santa Ana's best trained regular men. These aren't volunteers, these are regulars that Walker rides in on. These are the same guys that brought the Alamo down in 1836. And Walker just shows up with a tenth of the size in men and runs these guys right out of town. I mean, just completely scares them, turns them heel to toe, and they're out. To add insult to injury, Walker fired the Mexicans' cannons at the fleeing army by using his Walker Colts. He wheels the guns around at the retreating Mexicans, and he pulls out this new revolver that he got from Colt, and he cocks it, and he fires the full blast right into the breech of the cannon knowing that the fire from the charge is going to light off the round in the, in the can. And sure enough, it does. And he takes both guns, and he's firing these artillery pieces that the Mexicans left behind. Outside of town, the Mexicans realized that a much smaller force, armed with loud and powerful handguns, had routed them. They returned and began fighting bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat. One of the Mexicans gets on a balcony across the town square and he fires musket shotgun. One of the many bullets that that thing fires 
uh, creases Walker's head and also his upper chest. And as he takes his fatal wound and slumps down to the pavement and door frame of a house, he uh, tells the men, don't, don't give up, keep fighting without me. And he turns his guns over to uh, one of the troopers in his command, William Ashbaugh, and, uh, and then expires. The death of the much-loved Walker sent the Rangers on a rampage. They destroyed the town and everything in it. Walker was young in his mid-30s, very slight of build, blue eyes. He was the bon vivant of, of, of military courage. Uh, to learn that he died in battle uh, like that, they went nuts. It was the first time in American military history that you might say they stood a good grounds for wartime atrocities. Uh, they laid waste to the town. The Mexicans were eventually pushed out. Uh, no quarter was given. You may as well have flown a black flag. Uh, you weren't taking prisoners. Uh, everything got torched. Uh, it was a real ugly scene in the mantle of the, the evening of Walker's death. When we continue, the charge of wild beasts in Africa leads British gun companies to create the first true magnum. It took nearly 150 years to discover what happened to the guns Samuel Walker gave away when he died. They were eventually returned to his family and today are housed in a private gun collection. The Magnum will be right back. You're watching The Magnum on Modern Marvels. The gun rooms at the Holland and Holland Firearms Company in London, England possess the distinct whisper of days gone by. Trophies of game, both large and small, bagged by guns manufactured by Holland and Holland, line the walls. And we're probably more famous throughout the world for the manufacture of sporting rifles, while our hunting rifles cover the whole spectrum. So from deer stalking, uh, typically in Scotland or in the home counties, uh, right the way through to the largest game, the African game. The company is nearly 200 years old. Its effort to make extra powerful hunting rifles in the 1880s led to the development of the modern day Magnum. It was the age of Sherlock Holmes. The Industrial Revolution had gripped the city. Smokestacks from factories turned the sky black with an obnoxious smog. As the writer Oscar Wilde succinctly put it at the time, the nice thing about living in London is you can see the air you're breathing. To escape from the unhealthy chaos of the city, wealthy English gentlemen traveled to the wilds of Africa to hunt big game. They called their adventures safaris, which lasted for months and had as many as a hundred people trudging through the jungles hunting dangerous animals. Victorian hunters were shooting just about everything that moved. Uh, there wasn't too much regulation back then. Uh, elephants, tigers, lions, various types of antelope, giraffes, uh, rhinoceroses, basically pretty much anything that they could encounter. And they'd have guns, a number of different guns with them of varying calibers and varying powers to deal with whatever creature they came across. But the hunters on these expeditions quickly realized they had a problem, a big problem. Many of the guns they used were ineffective against the largest and most dangerous animals in Africa. There's no doubt that in those days, the reliability of the rifles, although good, was, it was nothing like the quality of rifles and ammunition today. One could not rely so much on, on the ammunition that you had in those days. Certainly the, the, the calibers were there to do the business in, in any African situation. Misfires and the failure of the rifle the ammunition is not a situation you want when, when something dangerous and angry is, is, is charging you. A simple hunting rifle used back in England to shoot boar or quail was no match for a charging elephant. Many hunters were killed, not because they were bad shots, but because their guns could not do the job. When you're chasing a lion or a tiger or an elephant, the Emphasis, of course, is to stop the animal as quickly as possible so that you protect yourself from any kind of danger. And therefore, the big game hunters were continually searching for a cartridge that would have this tremendous stopping power. 
They'd essentially like a cartridge that was as strong as a freight train, that when it hit an animal, it stopped it dead in its track. So they needed bigger bullets and larger cartridges, larger cartridge cases, to get the effect that they wanted. So if you're shooting an elephant or a, a tiger or something like that, you needed a large, slow-moving, heavy bullet to try to take them down. Once they realized what the need was, others then followed on, and the sport hunter followed in the footsteps of the first people who were literally opening up the country and discovering what was there. So this information then came back and the gun makers set about meeting the needs of the sportsmen. So this is how the development of these new calibers came about and moving from the bore rifles to the express rifles. To give the hunters a sporting chance, Holland and Holland developed in the mid 1880s an express rifle named after express trains that ran from the English countryside into the city without stopping. Well, express rifles come about because of the velocity at which the bullet was propelled. A more effective means of sealing the chamber was found and it was possible to raise the pressures and develop higher velocities and hence the express. And it's possible to produce as much energy in a bullet by speeding it faster so that you could have a smaller projectile traveling at a higher velocity, but would still deliver the same impact energy. When introduced to African safari hunters, the gun was an immediate success. Hunters no longer worried that large game could take a bullet and keep coming. Express rifles were forged with super strong double barrels. Because of this added strength, cartridges packed with high loads of gunpowder could be fired safely from each barrel at the same time. The result was a gun that could shoot a bullet nearly 50% faster than traditional hunting rifles, meaning more deadly shots. The method of shooting most commonly in those days was to literally puncture a large hole in its vitals and let the blood run out. So when an animal was shot, it was quite typical that there would be a follow-up until this chain of events took place. Now the reason for this was that the projectiles that were being used in the main soft lead were just not incapable of penetrating very dense tissue such as bone, so it was more prudent then to shoot into the softer area of the beast. With the advent of the express cartridges and much higher velocity from the bullets and alloying the bullets and then later on putting cupronickel jackets over the lead ball itself and turning the ball into a bullet, then it was possible to get more uh, penetration. And then uh, smaller calibers traveling at higher velocities were able to put a beast down straight away. It was sometime during the late 19th century that the term magnum was first used to describe high-powered guns. No one is really sure who first attached the word to the weapons, but it's certain the word was taken from the oversized bottle of French champagne. The word magnum comes from the Latin magnus, meaning great. The Rothschilds have been using the term magnum as one of their largest bottles of wine or champagne. It's almost a half a gallon of, of champagne. When they were casting about for a catchy name to give this new high-powered cartridge that they've developed for a handgun, uh, they settled on the magnum. It's believed that English hunters who opened up their cartridges and put in more gunpowder to create rounds that packed more punch could have coined the term. But in the coming decades, not many gun companies jumped on the Magnum bandwagon. Even the British military was disinterested and passed on buying any of the guns. Because Magnum rifles were built to withstand the extra explosive charge of a Magnum shell, the guns were heavier and more difficult to carry into battle. By the turn of the century, only big game hunters had any interest in high-powered guns. The most famous big game hunter of the day was U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. When he left office in 1909, Roosevelt mounted the greatest African safari ever seen, complete with an arsenal of high-powered weaponry. He wanted to mount a, a safari like nobody had ever seen before, and he pretty well did. It was, it was quite an extravaganza. 
You had a Holland Holland 500 450, very powerful double rifle, uh, 30 40 Craig, which was a military caliber and uh, that was very popular. Basically, he took enough guns with him to deal with just about anything he would encounter, and, and he pretty well shot it. He sent back lots and lots of specimens, a number of which are in, in uh, museums in the United States. World War I put an end to the construction of Magnum guns as well as most sporting rifles. British gun makers instead set their sights on more pressing wartime issues. Sporting rifle manufacture came to a, a complete end by 1915. Um, but our knowledge and expertise with ballistics and rifles in general involved us in the development of a shotgun that fired a special projectile for ripping holes in the coverings of Zeppelin airships. When we continue, an American gunmaker captures the massive power of a Magnum rifle in a handgun. Roosevelt's Safari of 1909 was a major media event. Besides 100 staff members, two dozen journalists traveled with the former president to chronicle the journey. The Magnum will continue in a moment. You're watching The Magnum on Modern Marvels. In the early 1930s, superpowered British hunting rifles named Magnums caught the attention of officials at an American gun company called Smith & Wesson. Avid hunters, the Wessons, saw how the extra power of these guns could be of interest to American hunters in the West. But Smith & Wesson was best known for its handguns, which were famous throughout the world. Company owners D.B. and Victor Wesson wondered if the powerful charge of a Magnum rifle could be harnessed in a handgun. Doug Wesson was an outdoorsman, a big game hunter, uh, and he was not afraid of, of recoil. Um, Victor Wesson, um, who was um, plant superintendent at the time, said, oh, nobody would buy that gun because it's going to recoil so much and it, it, you won't be able to handle it. It's far greater than anyone's going to be interested in. But the nation was in the grips of a crime wave. Gangsters and so-called motorized bandits who prowled the country in fast-moving cars were terrorizing the public. At the time, Smith & Wesson's best-selling revolver was the 38 Special, a favorite among police agencies and criminals alike. The customary velocity of the 38 Special Service cartridge around that time was a 158 grain lead round nose bullet going about 850 feet per second. And this just was not enough to defeat the bulletproof vest or penetrate the auto bodies of the period. Cops were asking for more power in their handguns to battle the well-armed bad guys. Smith & Wesson believed a Magnum handgun could be the answer. The company began experimenting with a stronger frame for its 38 Special. After two years, they came upon the right mix of steel and strength. In 1935, Smith & Wesson introduced the 357 Magnum revolver a louder, more violent, more expensive cousin of the 38 Special. When they um, built the guns and started to offer them, it was a custom-built firearm. Now, we're talking about the time when we were in a depression, where the average handgun at Smith & Wesson was selling for around $25 to $30. The 357 Magnum, when it was introduced, was introduced at $60. The first 357 Magnum off the manufacturing line, registration number one, was sent to J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI. Hoover liked the gun so much that he instructed his field officers to test it and order one for themselves if the power of the weapon suited them. Like Magnum rifles, the handgun had an incredible kick compared to normal guns of the time. The muzzle flash was tremendous, and the noise it made was enough to scare a criminal into submission. Several police departments adopted the Magnum as their service revolver. This is a late vintage 357 Magnum, 
made it probably in the 1970s, but quite similar to the guns made in the 1930s. This was built, again, on a large frame. It, um, the original ones were virtually custom made. They came with a registration number. The registered Smith & Wesson Magnums some um, are often thought to have been the finest revolvers ever made. Unlike its predecessor, the Magnum and Express Rifles, Smith & Wesson had a tough time filling all the orders for the 357 Magnum handgun. Police officials liked the extra power of the gun and ordered thousands of them, but officers in the field didn't like the size and weight. So, many law enforcement agencies opted to stick with a 38 Special to keep their officers happy. The one place the Magnum did find acceptance was with big game hunters. The same people who had needed a bigger and better rifle a half century earlier now flocked to the Magnum handgun. All of the firearms enthusiasts, uh, being a handgun hunter, competitive shooter, were interested in trying this world's most powerful handgun. The big game hunters, after Doug Wesson took it out west and successfully killed a moose and an elk and an antelope with it, uh, wanted to try the gun and big game. Hunters loved being able to carry a handgun into the bush instead of a bulky rifle. It seemed the Magnum was relegated once again to bringing down big game in the American West and the wilds of Africa. A good example of the reverence for the gun is best surmised in a passage from a Smith & Wesson publication in 1938. A Catholic priest named Bernard R. Hubbard wrote to Smith & Wesson from his post in Nome, Alaska. He wanted the company to know that the new 357 Magnum handgun had saved the lives of his Eskimo parishioners during a recent walrus hunt. The hunting had been poor that year, and the Eskimos were in danger of starving unless a large walrus was brought down. Father Hubbard says, in part, the Eskimo hunters are very impressed with the Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum after seeing them in action on the walrus herd, as they are the most prized weapon any of us have ever had. Father Hubbard doesn't give the weight of the big bull but as it was the largest bull this past season, and we know that 2,000 pounds is not an unusual weight for these animals, we really feel that three bulls with three bullets definitely established the 357 Magnum as a big game revolver on its own right. As had happened before, a world war nearly made this newly minted Magnum extinct though the gun did have at least one big fan in the military. General George Patton carried a Colt revolver on one hip and a Magnum on the other. But American troops would never carry such an unwieldy gun into battle. Following the war, Smith & Wesson revived experiments with the Magnum-sized guns, believing more power was the future of weaponry. To push the limits of just how powerful a handgun the company could make, it constructed the gun that would become famous throughout the world, the 44 Magnum. The gun was first put on the market in 1956. It was huge by anyone's standards. It came in a variety of barrel lengths, from 4 inches up to 8 and 3 eighths inches. It fired a 44 caliber slug more than 1,400 feet a second. Shooting a 44 Magnum, I think, depends a lot on who you are and what your psyche is about it. Um, I've had people who shot it. Um, my daughter, when she was nine, enjoyed shooting a 44 Magnum. She thought it was fun. Um, I've had big men who were afraid to shoot it, and when it would go off, uh, almost drop it out of their hands. Uh, I grew up with big bore guns, and so to me, it, it's not uncomfortable to shoot it. It has a lot of recoil, it has a lot of noise. 
and that, but if you're used to it and you're controlled and you're mentally prepared, it's not as dramatic as most people think. When we continue, a Hollywood movie creates the biggest push for Magnums in the gun's history. During the first half of the 20th century, the Smith & Wesson 44 caliber handgun and later the 44 caliber Magnum handgun were among the company's worst selling weapons. The Magnum will be right back. You're watching The Magnum on Modern Marvels. In the late 1960s, an actor named Clint Eastwood was making his way through the ranks of Hollywood's leading action heroes. He had starred in a series of spaghetti westerns that had given him a cult following. Now, Hollywood was ready to make him a star. In 1971, the vehicle chosen for the tough-talking Eastwood was that of a San Francisco cop named Harry Callahan. The character's nickname was Dirty Harry, and he carried a very large handgun, a Smith & Wesson 44 Magnum. Film director John Milius was called in to punch up the script for the movie. This is one of the Dirty Harry revolvers, the one of the first ones from the first movie. And, uh, Warner Brothers gave me this after I worked on the first one and wrote the second one, too. And so, that was at that time we thought that would probably be all of them that would ever get made, so... I said, well, I'd like to have one of those guns, since I'm the one who brought it to everybody's attention. The scene that was heard around the world was simple. San Francisco Police Detective Harry Callahan was just sitting down for lunch when a criminal robs a bank. An annoyed Callahan gives chase. This guy is, is wounded and on the ground, and that's when he comes up to him. And the guy's going to reach for his gun, and he says, I don't know whether I fired five or six. And he's still eating the rest of his hamburger. And then, of course, the guy says, I got to know. And, of course, he pulls, he points it, and the guy's horrified. He pulls the trigger, and it's empty. So the whole time, he'd fired six. It was a gun executive's dream. Overnight, the sales of the 44 Magnum went through the roof. Smith & Wesson was inundated with orders and could not keep up with demand. 44 Magnums were being uh, sold on black market at three and four and five times the price, retail price of the gun. The gun was to retail you know, slightly over $150, $160. Then they were commonly being sold in the mid-70s for six and $700. The 44 Magnum craze lasted about five years. Smith & Wesson officials say many of those guns sold during the early and mid-1970s were fired once or twice and never fired again. It's amazing, and that I've talked to lots of people in my different capacities at Smith & Wesson, that bought 44 Magnums from the Clint Eastwood period and yet never even shot them and had no idea. They were scared of the gun because of what Clint had said and how powerful it was. They were afraid to really go out and shoot it. But the Dirty Harry phenomenon solidified the Magnum as one of the most famous guns in the world. Today, at the Smith & Wesson assembly plant in Springfield, Massachusetts, the gun is still made though in smaller numbers. It's handcrafted from more than 50 parts. Precision equipment is used to check the machining on each Magnum. Each gun is engraved with a laser. And every Magnum is tested at Smith & Wesson's indoor firing range for accuracy. When finished, it's boxed and shipped to gun buyers who don't mind the kick of a powerful handgun. At a private firing range in the mountains north of Los Angeles, gun writers Gary James and Jan Liberal test a series of Magnums and Magnum-style guns. I reckon of all the guns here, the 454 is going to be the nastiest today. What do you think? Um. 
I think it'll be between that and your um, uh, 577 Howda pistol. What I thought we might do, Jan, just, just for the heck of it, seeing as you've got the 454 Cassell, which we reckon is the most powerful, well, we know is the most powerful gun out here today, and I've got the 577 Snyder Howda pistol. Why don't you shoot a couple of rounds out of yours, I'll shoot a couple of rounds out of mine, and then we'll switch. Well, there you go. Do you want to try? Tell you right now, that's going to be pretty nasty. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not too bad. Wrap the knuckles a little bit. Yeah. Are we ready? He's going to smack me in the forehead? No, I won't smack you in the forehead. Recoils over. To the left. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Give that one a try. Even for seasoned gun enthusiasts, firing magnums old and new makes a trip to the firing range an experience to remember. When we return, the speed of a magnum bullet is seen on a firing range actually splitting the air. When John Milius was called in to punch up the script for the first Dirty Harry movie, Clint Eastwood had not yet been offered the lead part. The actor originally slated to play the role of Dirty Harry was Frank Sinatra. The Magnum will continue in a moment. You're watching The Magnum on Modern Marvels. Already on the firing line. You may commence firing. At Fort Benning, Georgia, some of the most elite marksmen in the world fire state-of-the-art, handcrafted Magnum rifles. The Army recruits members of this team from a young age. The shooters compete in Olympic-class marksmanship contests throughout the world. The 16 members of the Army team fire all types of weapons when they compete, but they say there is nothing quite like firing a Magnum. My favorite part about the 300 Winchester Magnum is the report. When you're in a when you're in a large a large shooting community and and one of the 300 Winchester Magnums is fired, there's no there's no questioning what just went off next to it. What I like about the 300 Winchester Magnum is the fact that you can shoot a heavier bullet at a faster velocity than almost any of the other competition cartridges that anybody is using and you know that on a day like this when you've got the 15 to 20 or 25 mile an hour winds you have an edge over the rest of the competition because your bullet is going to fly straighter in the wind than theirs is the targets being fired at are six feet tall though at a distance of 600 yards they barely look the size of a postage stamp as the bullets from the guns are fired Soldiers downrange mark the targets so the shooters can see where their shots strike. I originally started shooting the Magnum in 1978. Uh, 1978 was a time frame when, when the 300 Winchester Magnum uh, was really coming into itself. Everybody was testing new loads. The gun over the years has really come into itself. It's an awesome gun to fire and accuracy is, is just unbelievable firing the weapon from a sniper's position takes years of practice and a great deal of patience generally after each you have to rebuild the position because of the recoil of the magnum you need to rebuild your position after each shot so that you have a good natural point of aim what I'm uh, getting ready to shoot is a 30 caliber 220 grain bullet loaded into a 300 Winchester Magnum case. I'm going to check my wind. I'm going to put left windage on the rifle. Okay, I put three quarters of a minute wind on the rifle. Hey, hopefully that one's in the middle. It broke straight away. And that's where it is. It's a dead center X. The Army's competitive firearms team is serious business. 
so much so that they hand make all their Magnum rifles. The Magnums are custom built for the individual shooters and they go through the same process as our weapons do. And one of the main processes is, is that we make the Magnums utilizing our barrels and our specifications. We order these barrel brains from various manufacturers and then we will profile them ourselves, chamber them, and may or may not flute them, and then they'll go on the shooter's individual weapon. Every shell to be fired is handmade at Fort Benning. First, the empty cases are measured and primed. Next, the empty shells are deburred and checked to ensure proper size to within a hundredth of an inch. Then, a soldier technician carefully measures the number of grains to be placed in each cartridge to ensure exact power. And finally, the bullet itself is seated onto the newly minted Magnum cartridge. It's then measured to be sure it meets the requirements for being fired in the 300 Magnum rifle. The round is now ready for the firing range. The highly refined process comes together on this range and others like it, where the Magnum rifles, the hand-packed rounds, and the shooter work in unison. Maximum distance shooting is very difficult. The number of variables is endless. I mean, you can see the wind today is blowing 20 miles an hour plus. Uh, a lot of times you will have to compete in rain, 100 degree plus temperatures. Pretty rigorous activity, really. At the National Rifle Association's museum in Fairfax, Virginia, one of the world's most extensive collections of historic weapons is on display. Every year, more than 60,000 people visit the facility to see these guns. Many of them ask the same question. Is there, somewhere in the massive display, a Magnum? Whether you like guns or not, you probably watch Dirty Harry. And uh, if you can identify any type of gun, and, and not, not knowing anything about them, most people are going to reference the only thing they know, the 44 Magnum. So when they come in here and they want to see Dirty Harry's revolver, we actually have. Since the inception of Magnum-style weapons, the quest to make a souped-up, highly-charged gun has captivated gun makers and buyers. The answer was found in a gun aptly named the Magnum. Its effect has been felt from the frozen tundra of Alaska to the searing plains of Africa. It has been on the front lines of law enforcement in the hands of real police and has helped save the day in the fictional world on the silver screen. It's one of the most famous and most powerful guns in the world. A weapon that carries with it a mystique as forceful as its name, the Magnum.